Third John is where we're at. Let's pray before we get into it. Let's ask the Lord to bless the study. Thank you, Lord, uh, for your word. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for ministry and, and uh, the fact that we get to be involved in the things that you're doing. And uh, Lord, we thank you for men and women who have right hearts when they're doing it. Um, Lord, as we go through this letter, um, we're going to be talking about a guy who has a bad heart in doing ministry. And uh, Father, we just pray that uh, we'd be able to learn uh, not only from the good examples, but also from the bad examples and uh, just be men and women who serve you uh, in the way that you've called us to. And we ask that you do this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, third John, third letter um, from John. Uh, uh, obviously goes first, second, and third John. In first John, the major emphasis in the book is having fellowship with God. In second John, uh, the major emphasis in that book, that small letter is uh, forbidding fellowship with false teachers. And in third John, um, what John does is encourages fellowship with true believers. And uh, we're going to be talking about, uh, like, I, like I was praying about, a guy who's not a really good example. It's the shortest, this is the shortest letter book in the Bible. It's written about 90 AD uh, by John the Apostle. And in the, in the book, you have four people mentioned. And uh, the first one is the elder. That's talking about John the Apostle. And then you have a guy named Gaius and another guy, Diotrephes, and the last guy, Demetrius. And so I just kind of divided the, the book up into... Uh, John's statements about these guys. Um, it starts off, the elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. And uh, again, when you have letters in the New Testament, uh, the letters always start out uh, with the signature, basically. And so we start, we start out, dear John, and end it with love, Steve. And uh, they start out with um, Steve to dear John. And that's, that's the beginning of the letter. I think that the way that the Bible does it is, makes way more sense than, than the way we do it. And, you know, I, I don't know, a lot of times, well, you know, a lot of times we don't, we're not getting printed letters anyway and snail mail and that kind of stuff. And, and so, in effect, we get this done because whoever's writing to you is in the heading of your email, right? And so you can, you can see it. It's kind of, kind of the same thing. So, in any case, we start off with the elder, and that's... Uh, the, uh, basically, the signature of John. The word "elder" is presbuteros in that passage. In this passage, actually, all the way through the New Testament, the word "elder" is presbuteros. It's where we get our word "presbytery," and um, it carries the idea of somebody, obviously, who's older, but somebody who's wiser, somebody who's um, ha who has some biblical wisdom. And one of the things uh, that we need to uh, carry around um, from that kind of thing is that we all need to be an elder. In the sense, not the not necessarily the sense of of uh, having all the experience that comes from years of uh, doing things or or being involved in ministry, but being an elder in the sense that we have some biblical wisdom. When I was, um, gosh, how old was I? I was 22 years old, no, 23 years old, uh, when I started doing pastoral ministry, and I wasn't a pastor yet, but um, the the church I was at. Uh, basically trained me for counseling. And so I went through a counseling course with uh, some of the pastors and they set me up. And um, I had a couple of uh, counseling sessions. The first one was, 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 was pretty weird. And I'm not going to tell you about that one because that's not the one I want to talk about. Um, but the second counseling session I had was with a, with a couple that were probably in their 40s and they came in for marriage counseling. Well, I'm 23. And so I, I'm sitting there and they're across the desk from me and the guy's looking at me. <laughs> you know, he's got one of those looks on his faces. And he goes, how old are you? And I go, well, I'm 23. And he goes, are you married? And I go, yeah. How long? Oh, about six months. <laughs> and I'm going to give this guy counsel. And what I said to him was, you know what? I'm not going to be able to give you any kind of counsel on your marriage that comes from my experience. Because I've only been married six months. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have that kind of experience. But I, what I can do is I can tell you what the Bible has to say about marriage because that's something that I do know. And he looked at me and he kind of smiled and he goes, fair enough, proceed. <laughs> you know? And so we got into the counseling session. And that's one of the things that um, we need to keep in mind. No matter how old you are in the Lord, you can have the wisdom that comes from God just because you believe the word of God and you, and you stick to the word of God and you, you share the word of God 
you have wisdom that goes way beyond your years. In fact, um, when Paul was writing to Timothy, uh, there's a section in there where Paul says, don't let anybody but despise your youth, but be an example to the brethren in word and in deed. And, you know, he goes on through this whole thing uh, as far as just having that kind of lifestyle. And so you can have an elder's wisdom just by paying attention to what the Bible has to say, including in this passage. You have an elder speaking to uh, uh, a guy who's in ministry at a church that's having problems. And if you know 3 John and you know what it has to say and what he has to say, you're going to have the same kind of wisdom that that elder has. In any case, in John's case, he was an elder. He's he's in his 90s um, at the point that he wrote this letter, most likely. And he didn't need to uh, sign his name in the sense of, you know, John the Apostle, because obviously he was known, like we talked about in 2 John, he was known by the recipient, and so there was no need for that. Um, John also, as an old man at this point, uses the title twofold. He is elder, um, like we were talking about. He's an older man. Um, But again, presbyteros was a term that was used for bishops and overseers and pastors and and elders, that that whole thing in the latter part of the first century. It's probably a term that had really special um, significance because John's the last surviving apostle. And so um, at this point, uh, in the history of the church, he would be the elder. He's the, he's the last guy that was involved in ministry with Jesus. And so he's somebody to be respected. He's somebody to be looked up to. He's somebody to be listened to. And uh, people should have been doing it. And the recipient is a guy named Gaius. He says, to the beloved Gaius. And that uh, word comes, uh, the word beloved comes from the word agape. And our word for beloved probably doesn't do it justice. It's the idea of, of, uh, of a love that's um, intense, the kind of love that God has for us. And that's the kind of love that he's um, uh, professing towards Gaius. And then he reiterates that whole thing by saying, I love you in the truth. Um, I, love, I, I love you in truth. Um, I really do love you, Gaius. And so it's not just a greeting with, with John. And Gaius is a faithful follower of Jesus, and he's the first guy that we're going to be talking about in this letter. Um, when, when you look for, at the next section here, which goes all the way down to verse 8, um, it's basically John's thankfulness for Gaius' godliness. Um, in verse 2, it says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. For I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you. Just as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. And so the first thing that he he says when he's um, getting into the letter with Gaius is basically he gives the guy um, one of the standard blessings of the first century. This is uh, in in verse 2 when he says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. That's a, that's a greeting that you see in lots of letters in the first century. So it's not something that, that's specific and doctrinal in this instance. You need, and you need to understand that. That's like, that's like me writing a letter and saying, Dear Joe. Well, to say, say, it's just, you know, say I'm, I'm, I'm writing to a banker, right? So I've got a banker, and um, I write to him, and I go, Dear Joe. Well, you know what? Joe's probably not dear to me. In fact, I don't know Joe very well at all. And I certainly don't know him well enough to say, Joe, you're really dear to me, and I mean it. You're dear. Such a dear. You know, that, that kind of stuff. It's just a standard greeting, and nobody's going nobody's gonna to take off on that and start you know, making up stories about me and Joe at that point if I say, dear Joe. You follow me? So you got some, pretty much the same thing in this passage. But you know what? Every word of God is something that we need to take seriously. It is a standard um, blessing of the first century. In fact, the whole blessing uh, was routinely abbreviated. A lot of times when these guys would write um, their letters, because paper was so expensive, they would abbreviate standard greetings. And this is one of the greetings that's abbreviated. They just take the first letter of each one of the words, and everybody knows what the words mean, like LOL or OMG, or for non-Christians, that's oh my God. For Christians, that's oh my goodness, right? And so, you know, it's like, so we have these, we have these abbreviations. Well, we had them in the first century too, uh, because again, paper was so expensive. So this is one of those. And so you have that. 
Let's, let's look at what it says. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. Let's think about that for a second. Is that a blessing? Or is that a curse? So how's your soul doing? Yeah. And when your soul's doing well, that's a blessing, isn't it? What if your soul's not doing well? And I say to you, I pray that, you're, that you prosper just as your soul is prospering and your soul's all ragged and, and trashed and, and, and messed up. And I pray that your, your body's in the same health that your soul's in and your soul's all, all tweaked and falling apart and, and that kind of thing. Do you want your body to be like, and that's the question. Do you want, do you want your prosperity to, to have the same prosperity that your soul has? Do you want your body to have the same um, health that your soul has. And it's, good, it's a good thing to, to look at because on, on the one hand, um, this can be a blessing. On the other hand, it can be an absolute curse. So it's only a blessing on those um, who have an awesome spiritual state. Depend, and what I'm saying is it depends on the spiritual state of the person. If God conferred on our, uh, on our physical bodies the same prosperity and health as that of our souls, that could be a good thing or that could be a bad thing, and, and uh, we need to keep it in mind. I know lots of prosperity gospel people who um, like to quote this verse, and they're nothing but graspy and greedy and mean, and their soul's not in good shape at all. And so, again, you have to, you have to watch out for it. There's six spiritually, and unbelievers, you have obviously the same situation. So that's only a blessing when your soul's doing well with the Lord, obviously. Um, when, when you uh, look at that passage right there, it's really interesting that modern medicine has made a link between the emotional mental health of an individual and their physical health. Have you read articles like that? And so a lot of times, you know, people who, who are constantly depressed, constantly bummed out, constantly stressed, uh, constantly on edge, their physical um, welfare starts going down the tubes. But people who are happy and well-adjusted and having a good home life and, and that kind of thing, married guys live longer than single guys. You know, that, that kind of, you know, you have the, all these studies that come out all the time. And uh, it's really interesting that um, the medical world is catching up with what the Bible has to say. In fact, there's a, there's a passage in Proverbs 17, that says, a merry heart does good like medicine, but a broken spirit dries the bones. And so, Mary Hart does good like a medicine. We should all have joke books around our dining room table. You know, when you have dinner at night, just whip out the joke book and start telling jokes. Did you know that, that, that um, happiness is good for your digestion, is what they've said? And so, again, you, you have this stuff in the Bible, so um, we, need to, we need to be um, having a happy life. Exuberant instead of ulcerated is what I want my belly to be. So then, you go, then he goes on and he begins talking about Gaius' godly walk, um, the good news of his godly walk. Verse three, he says, I rejoiced greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. You know what, there, there is no joy like running into an old friend, and especially if the old friend is a disciple, somebody that you raised up in the Lord, and finding a godly, committed follower of Jesus. Um, you know, I, I, I've told you I was a high school youth leader, and um, I run into some of my kids. They're, they're actually, <laughs> they're in their late 40s, early 50s. Those were my kids in high school. And uh, I run into these guys, and a lot of times I'm running into them, and the reason I run into them is because they're believers and uh, happen to see them in a church or, or something that I'm visiting. Uh, one of the kids that... Uh, grew up in my fellowship. His uh, family was really messed up, all into drugs. They, you know, they were his mom and dad were classic hippies and and uh, smoking pot and, and that kind of stuff in front of the kids in the house. All mad because uh, he's following Jesus because uh, and and not out partying specifically. Um, he was a kid that uh, came up to me this one time and he said, "You know what? My parents are all ticked off at me. They said to me, I would rather that you were out partying than following Jesus. You know, being a Christian." And so that's the kind of home he came from. And he's a pastor now. You know, and he's just going for it with the Lord. It's really awesome. 
And I've told you about the, the girl that lived in our house. She's walking with Jesus. Her best friend that uh, um, hung out at our, um, uh, our high school study, she's walking with the Lord and, and just doing really well. And it's, it's decades later. You know, this is like 30 years later. And these guys are following Jesus and going for it. And there's, there's nothing like running into people uh, that you led to the Lord and, and uh, um, brought up in Jesus and finding out that they're, uh, uh, that they're committed followers of Christ. Very cool thing. And that's what John says about Gaius. Apparently Gaius was somebody that John knew pretty well at, at one point. He goes on and says um, in verse 5, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. And so not, not only um, is this guy a committed follower of Christ, but he's a guy who, who you can actually look at and see that he's a committed follower of Christ by the way that he treats people who are around him. And in, in, the, in this instance, John's talking about enter, entertaining strangers and brethren. And what he's talking about is that whole issue of itinerant preachers. So John would send guys out to the different churches to go around and, and share the word with them and teach them a little deeper about what uh, Jesus had to say. You gotta remember that in the first century, um, they didn't have Bibles like we have. And so they would, they would have scrolls um, with the books of the Bible in them, but a lot of times the library that was in a church was not a whole Bible like what we have. And so they may have the Old Testament, and, and so a lot of teaching can be done out of the Old Testament. But as far as the New Testament, they probably had Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. And then depending on the area that they were in, they would have the letters that were sent by the apostles to the area that they were in. And so this is in Asia Minor, for example. And so you would have John's letters um, that would be passed around. There's a good chance they had 1 John. They might have had James. Um, they might have had some of the epistles of Paul because that was just across the Aegean Sea. And so some of the epistles of Paul might have gotten to them, but they by no means had the whole New Testament. And so a lot of times the apostles are sending out guys to the different churches uh, to teach them more fully the things that Jesus had for them. And, you know, obviously sometimes these guys would bring letters from other apostles that they may not have known about. In any case, when these guys would come, uh, people would check them out to see if they were okay, if they were really what they, what they purported to be, and uh, not just guys going around ripping off churches. We talked about that last week, uh, people who just go around ripping off churches. And in this instance, John is commending Gaius because when the brothers come in, these guys who are going around preaching the word, when they come in, uh, Gaius was a guy who would entertain them. There is, uh, there's a number of passages in the Bible that talk about entertaining strangers. And so you know the one in Hebrews that says we need to entertain strangers because in so doing, some people have enter entertained uh, angels without knowing it. What a cool thing. Wouldn't that be cool? Figure out, you know, it's, a, it's like you invite somebody into your home, you, you know, you meet them on, at some point, you find them out they're a believer, you ask them, you know, where you stand? Well, I'm not really staying anywhere, I'm just kind of passing through. Hey, would you like to come over for dinner before you get out? And they come over for dinner and you have a great conversation, and they're talking to you about the Lord and, and that kind of thing, just really good fellowship, and then at the end, they disappear. That would be the coolest thing ever. And you have examples of that in the Bible. And so uh, Paul in Hebrews says, don't forget to entertain strangers, because in so doing, again, some people have entertained angels without knowing it. There's a passage in 1 Timothy 3.2 that says this, and this is a qualification for, for a, an overseer or a bishop, and, uh, but it's, it's something that applies to each one of us too. It says, a bishop thus, then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, of good behavior, hospitable, hospitable, um, able to teach. See that word hospitable? I think I have the Greek up there. Do I have the Greek up there? Oh yeah, philozenos is what that says, philozenos. And that is somebody who loves aliens. Literally is what that means, somebody who loves aliens. And so you can, you can draw a picture of an alien with the, you know, the big head and the, the two you know, dark black eyes and stuff like that and put a big heart around it. And that's what the Bible says you're supposed to be. 
somebody who loves aliens. It's the idea of loving people that you don't know. It's a, the idea of loving strangers. And that, that's what being hospitable means. I love strangers. I'm not tweaked by strangers and I'm not flipped out by strangers. I'm somebody who loves strangers is what the, what the Bible teaches, again, that we're supposed to be. Now, we're living in times where that can get weird and we need to be careful about it because there's so many strange people going around. But you had some of the same things going on during the first century too. There was peace in the Roman Empire, but the peace had come by a sword and that didn't mean that there weren't, you know, guys out roaming around, you know, cutthroats and, and robbers and, and that kind of thing. And so they had to be careful at the same time then. It's a, it's a whole lot different now than it was when I was a kid. Um, when I was a kid, I would pick up anybody, you know, in the, you know, driving down the road and somebody's thumbing it and I would pick up anybody. I, I still would do that um, except for um, un, unless my wife is in the car or my kids are in the car. You know, I don't mind picking, you know, picking people up and giving them a ride and that kind of thing. Wouldn't pick up a woman, necessarily. If my wife was in the car, I might pick up a woman, but I don't know that I would. I'm not sure. I'd have to pray, I'd be praying. If I saw some, some girl on the side of the road, you know, and trucking it down the road, I'd be praying as I was going up to see if I, if I should do something like that. But you know, you, you, there, there's all these opportunities to be able to share with people when you're in situations like that. And so, I've always kind of been like that. I've had people live at my home and some of those things have gone really well. Um, and with every woman that lived in my home, everything went awesome. The, you know, having, having a lady stay with, your, with you, with your, you know, as long as it's husband and wife, that, that kind of thing, giving them a room for a while, that, that kind of thing, always awesome, almost always awesome with, uh, with all the girls. Oh, actually, in my case, always awesome. With all the guys, every one of them was a train wreck except for one. You know, and so, but you know, you just expect that stuff and you still have to be hospitable to people, loving strangers, right? And this was a guy who was exactly like that. Um, he goes on and talks about the fact um, that, the, that those strangers, those brethren and strangers have borne witness of your love before the church. Um, and then he, then he goes on and says, if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. And what John is talking about is the fact that he treated these guys with respect, treated ministers with respect. And that's something that's supposed to be done. Uh, in uh, 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, it says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. And what they're talking about is wages in that passage, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain and the laborer is worthy of his wages. That's a quote from, uh, that Paul's getting from Jesus. And so um, when, when you are dealing with people who are involved in ministry, and in this instance, it would kind of be like missionaries. When you're dealing with them, you, know, you need to check them out and make sure that they're for real and that kind of thing, but then you need to treat them respectfully because what they're doing is they're giving up their life for the, for the work of the ministry. And it's a very cool thing to be involved with that. We'll talk about that a little bit later in a minute. He goes on and says, taking nothing from the Gentiles. They went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. All kinds of religions were happening in the first century. Um, there were all kinds of, of uh, different itinerant preachers that were preachers uh, that were dealing with the Roman gods and with the Greek gods. And they had this tendency to go out and get uh, um, alms or, or, or get donations from the public. And you, you have that kind of mentality in a number of different areas. For example, in Buddhism, in Buddhism, if you're really gonna be a good Buddhist, if you're gonna do what Buddha said, you don't have a job. And what you do is you go around and you beg for money from anybody who will give it to you. And that's, that's kind of the mindset of some of these uh, religions in the first century. What, what John says here is that these guys go out and they take nothing from the Gentiles. They're there to minister to the Gentiles, not to take from them. They're there to give the gospel to the Gentiles, not take what they can get off of them. And so um, the thing that we can take away from that is that we need to be people that nobody can accuse, truthfully, of loving money, of wanting things from people, of uh, desiring to get their stuff. Um, 
if they do, if they do accuse you of that, it should be an absolute lie. And it's the idea of, you know, we just, we, we just depend on the Lord for the, the things uh, that we need provided for us. Financial difficulties are one of those things that are an opportunity for the power of God to be made known in your life. And so when, when I look at finances in my own life, you're never going to hear about my financial problems. I'm never going to tell them to you. And um, nobody, actually nobody on my staff is going to ever hear uh, about it. Nobody on the board is ever going to hear about my financial difficulties. The only one who ever hears about my financial difficulties is God. And the reason is because I'm really not interested in anybody filling my needs. What I'm, re- what I'm interested in is God taking care of those things. Uh, there was a song by Keith Green a long time ago where one of the lines in it was, I trust no man on earth to fill my need. Like the sparrow up above, I am enveloped with his love. And, uh, uh, and then I forgot the rest of the song. <laughs> oh, and I trust him like those little ones he feeds. And so that's, that's where we need to be. It's the same kind of attitude. I need to be somebody who trusts God. And you know what, you guys? Uh, um, actually, financial situations that, that come up in a, in a believer's life, I really believe, um, because of what Scripture has to say and just because of practical situations in my own life, I really believe that God puts believers through financial difficulties so that they will turn to Him and start seeing on paper or on your phone, or on your computer, but, but see in black and white how he's real and how he really provides. And, it, and it's one of those things that, that you need to keep in mind. Some of, the, some of the best stories I have of the reality of God, of God speaking to me, of God working in my life, have to do with financial issues, uh, where I've had problems with things and I had to go to the Lord about those things and he provided in just miraculous ways. And so you want to see God work whenever there's a financial um, problem that comes up. Stop going after all the stuff that you normally go after and just get on your knees and start talking to God and ask him to provide and see what happens. You know, there's some things that go along with that. And obviously, um, God wants us to be giving people. And so tithing and all that stuff goes along with that. I'm not going to make this a study about tithing. But your financial issues are, uh, again, an opportunity to see God um, work in awesome ways. And so we don't need to go around and beg. We don't need to go around and make money a big fat issue. And that's one of the reasons that, that you don't see it around here. Um, when we do offerings, we do offerings in certain ways because the Bible says so. So, so in uh, Corinthians, it talks about taking up an offering. That's the reason that we take up an offering on Sunday morning. That's the reason, because it's in the Bible. Another reason that we take up an offering on Sunday morning is so uh, people who walk in know that there are guys standing around who have some kind of authority here. You know, the guys, the guys with the offering bags, those are the ushers. And we've got, what is it? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then there's a couple in the back and there's more wandering around. And if I'm a freaky guy walking in here and I see the offering take place, I'm like, okay, there are guys that are around here that are doing, you know, these are, these are guys that are in control of things. And that's how freaky people think. And so it's one of the reasons that we do it. I want people to know that we've got ushers and, you know, they're, they're in charge of things around here. And that's for watching over the body and, and that kind of thing. But, when, you know, we, we, uh, we take up offerings and uh, that's, again, because the Bible says that. But you don't hear me talking about those things. When we, don't, when we take up an offering, we don't have a big to-do about the offering. It's just the, you know, the ushers come forward and, and we're going to receive the morning tithes and offerings. And we leave it at that and move on from that because... We're not into manipulating people. I'm not really interested in guilting people into giving. When we give to the Lord, we give to the Lord. And we give because we have a thankful heart. And that's the way that it's supposed to go. And it's not supposed to be anything else. The reason I'm kind of majoring on this is because I hated it when I watch, I still hate it, when I watch Christian TV and I see all these pleas for money and pleas for help and you know, please, please, please give. And even on the radio station, you know, you have guys who, who, who will talk about money all the time and, and that kind of thing. And I don't like it. I don't, think, I don't think that's something that Christians should be known for. And so we don't have that on our radio program. You know, we don't, we don't say, you know, this ministry is supported by the tithes and the offerings of God's people and, and that kind of thing. Because it's not. This ministry is supported by God. Not by the tithes and offerings of God's people. Does God use that stuff? Yes, but it's supported by God. 
And so, you know, God's the one who provides. And I, I think that, that we need to reflect that as believers. And so whether it's a ministry or whether it's an individual, we need to reflect that as believers. You're going through financial pro- problems and, you know, there are ways that people find out about that and they see you walking in joy and walking in peace and just trusting God through the midst of it. And they're like, hey, aren't you, you know, <laughs> hey, we, we all got our pay cut by half. And why are you still happy? And then you get, you've got an opportunity at that point to start talking to them about the fact that, you know, it's not my job that provides for me. It's Jesus who provides for me. And if he wants me to go on a diet, okay, man. <laughs> I could lose some weight, you know. And it needs to be that kind of attitude. You know what I mean? So we don't trust in people to fulfill our needs. We need to be trusting in the Lord. And obviously, you know, this guy's doing, he's being faithful and taking care of these guys and he's being commended for it. And that's something that needs to happen too. But, you know, there's a, there's a whole mindset there. He goes on, uh, again, verse seven, he says, because they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. And then look at verse eight. We therefore ought to receive such that we may become fellow workers for the truth. And this is one of those passages that teaches that when I am receiving missionaries or you know, even giving to church or uh, you know, we're, we're about to do the whole thing with the shoe boxes, uh, going over to Africa, um, we're, we're about to, to do the whole gift thing that we do every Christmas for families in town and that kind of stuff. And when we support ministry, what that does is it makes me a partner in the ministry that I'm supporting. And God takes that seriously. There's a passage in 1 Samuel chapter 30 where um, uh, there's there's an attack on the city that David's living in. And uh, basically what ends up happening is he goes out after the guys who've ripped off all the goods from their camp. And not only the goods, but they've taken people um, captive. They've they've got prisoners with them. And um, he takes off with a number of the guys, but there, there's a whole number of them that were not able to ride at that point. And so he says, okay, I want you to stay here with the goods and we're going to, with all the supplies, and then we're gonna go and take off and get these guys. Well, when they go off and get them, they end up capturing, uh, recapturing all the hostages. And in fact, they take back all their stuff. And then they take the stuff that these guys have taken from other people. And so there's a, there's a big cache of loot that comes from uh, that event. And when it's about to be given out, when it's about to be spread out to the different guys, what the, what the guys that went with David said was we should give them back their wives and their kids and nothing else because all they did was stay with the supplies. And David made a rule at that point. He said, he who stays with the goods shares an equal part with he who goes into the battle. And that's the principle that's being Uh, taught in this passage right here. He who stays with the goods has an equal share with the one who goes into the battle. And so there there is, there are are, uh, ministries that need to be taken care of that aren't necessarily on the front lines. And so when I write a check to Compassion, for example, for our Compassion kid, when I write a check to, to, uh, to Compassion, I am not the one that is ministering to that kid. I'm not the one who's on the ground in his country talking to him and sharing the Lord with him and, you know, and just being kind to him, and, you know, teaching him Bible verses and that kind, of, that kind of thing. There's somebody on the ground talking to that kid. But the fact that I've sent my support into that, and obviously prayerful support, the fact that I've sent my support into that makes me an equal partner in that ministry. I get to take part in that whole thing. And that's how God is going to be judging when, when we get to heaven. There, there are all these times when we can go out and we can be on the front lines and we can be doing things for Jesus. And then there are times when we can't, when we just can't. And, you know, we may have job commitments or we may be getting older and, and you know, we're not, we're not able to take off on a mission and that kind of thing. But when you support somebody who goes off on a mission, God sees all that. He understands it. And you know, that's, that's not a reason to get lazy and not be involved, but you need to understand that when, when you're giving to these things, that's how God looks at this. And so um, you become fellow workers um, for the truth. And that's a cool thing too. I like it that God sees things that way. I like it that, that, that God 
uh, treats us that way. And so when you give to missionaries, when you give to church, when you give to whatever you're giving to, um, God sees that as something that you are involved with um, specifically just because of your giving. And that's all Gaius. Gaius is a good guy. And so he's got, a, he's got a number of things that are going for him and things that we should be emulating uh, in his life, right? And then we have Diotrephes. In verse 9 through 11, it says, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. And so you have Diotrephes. And Diotrephes is just a tyrant for Jesus. In this passage, um, John says he loves to have the preeminence. And apparently John wrote a letter to the church that Diotrephes was a part of, and the letter wasn't received from the apostle John. That's crazy. That, that, that's like crazy arrogance on this dude's part. You know, and, and so here we are 2,000 years later, and I know all about John, you know, as much as the Bible has to say about him. He's one of the sons of thunders, thunder, one of the sons of thunders, one of the sons of thunder, which means he was a rowdy guy. That's what Jesus called him. He gave him the nickname, sons of thunder. So that means you're a rowdy guy. Whenever I think of John the apostle, I think of a guy riding a Harley, not, you know, not a rice burner, a Harley. You know, <laughs> when I say rice burner, what I'm talking about is a Yamaha or something like that. Um, uh, not, not riding one of those. He's riding a Harley. He's got a leather jacket on. He's got the chains that come, you know, come around and go to his wallet and stuff. I don't know why they need the chains on the wallet. Probably so guys can't get your wallet and that kind of thing. But in any, in any case, he's he's got a big old, you know, a big old picture on the back of his uh, uh, leather jacket, and it says "Sons of Sons of Thunder," you know, that kind of thing. Two heads there, James and John, Sons of Thunder. That's what I that's what I think of when I think of him. And he's kind of a rowdy guy. Um, he was also a loving guy. He loved Jesus. And so he had some rowdiness going. John is one of the guys, um, it was him and his brother who came to Jesus and they're in the, uh, in the area of Samaria and they were going through a village and the village was not, was not pleased with the presence of Jesus in their village. And they came up to Jesus and said, should we call down fire from heaven like Elijah did? And so they had a plan of action and they got it out of the Bible. <laughs> and so they bring it up to Jesus and he goes, uh, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of. <laughs> you know, the, the father didn't send, send the son into the world to, to destroy the world, but to save it. You know, and he, and he kind of backs them down. No, we don't want to kill them. No, we don't want to burn them alive. Okay, John, <laughs> you know, maybe we'll share the gospel with them. Maybe we'll do that, buddy. And so, you know, later on, obviously in the, uh, in the end, in the, in the 90s, John um, has become this guy who loves the truth and loves, loves love, but he gets pretty rowdy in this letter too. And he talks about Diotrephes and talks about the fact that um, we're going to have a little face-to-face -face here with Diotrephes in the not-too-distant future and see what he has to say to my face at that point. In any case, I, I can't believe guys like this who would come up and, and just have an attitude towards somebody who... Um, he should have nothing but respect for. He's, uh, John's the last apostle, and John is going to go down through um, all of history. And again, it's been 2,000 years, and Peter, James, and John are the guys who were always hanging out with Jesus. They were always the tightest with Jesus. And so he's one of those three guys. And so we know all about that. And then we have this joker, Diotrephes, who comes up in third John as a jerk. And so um, Diotrephes has been in the Bible for the last 2,000 years too, but most people don't know his name, and now you do. And now what he's going to be known for for the rest of your life, if you've never heard about it before, is being this jerk that had an attitude towards John the Apostle, you moron. And so anyway, uh, we have this. And, and you know, like I said, this is, this is a guy who is a tyrant for Jesus, obviously, um, it goes on and says, verse 10, uh, uh, did we read all that? If I come, I'll call to mind his deeds, which he's done, prating against us with malicious words, not content with that. He himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to, putting them out of the church. So he's kicking these guys out of the church for receiving missionaries and letting them stay at their house. 
And, you know, again, that's a, that's a tyrant for Jesus um, in that instance. When it says he loves to have the preeminence, turn over to Colossians 1. I want to, I want to show you something. Colossians chapter 1 goes Philippians, Ephesians, or excuse me, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, chapter 1, verse 15. And this passage is talking about Jesus, and it says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. This is what that means. When it said he, he creates all things that are in heaven and that are on the earth, it means everything. So everything that's in heaven... You're talking about the stars, you're talking about the planets, you're talking about the galaxies, you're talking about spiritual heaven too. And he makes that point in the very next uh, part of the verse, visible and invisible. So he created everything that you can see in the heavens and he created everything that you can't see in the heavens. And the things that you can't see in the heavens are thrones and dominions and principalities and powers. Those are talking about angelic rankings and so the Bible, we know, we know that one of the rankings of angels, it's called, called archangel. And so Michael is the archangel. And uh, the, the Bible talks about um, uh, being the angels of the presence, for example. There were two angels that were pictured as being on, on either side of the throne of God. There's some other angels that you see in the book of Isaiah. They're called seraphim, the burning ones. And they stand, stand around the throne of God and they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. There's another set of angels that you see in the book of Revelation and also in the book of Ezekiel that are called cherubim. Actually, um, uh, Satan was a cherub. Um, the Bible says he was the anointed cherub who covers. Looks like Satan and Michael may have been the two angels on either side of the throne of God. And so Michael's an archangel and it looks like Satan might have been an archangel too before he fell. And so principalities and powers, are these rankings that it talks about were created by Jesus. He's created all of those things. All things were created through him and they were created for him. They're all his. And then it, then it goes on and says, and he is before all things and in him all things consist. Literally all things are held together. And he is the head of the body, that's us, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Jesus is the one who's supposed to have the preeminence. It's not a dude named Diotrephes in 3 John. Jesus is the one who has the preeminence. And again, it's something that we need to keep in mind uh, as, as believers. Loving the preeminence, loving to be in a position of power is not something that we're called to do. Um, we're, what we're called to do is be servants to the people who are around us. I want to take you through a little um, survey through um, the Gospels, just, just um, two passages in the Gospels and then one in Philippians. Turn over to Mark chapter 9, Matthew, then Mark chapter 9, verse 33. And it says this, then he came to Capernaum, and again talking about Jesus, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent. For on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And so apparently they're, they're walking, this is one of my favorite stories. They're walking down the road with Jesus, right? And so probably they let Jesus get out ahead of them. And so they're back in, they're back in the back someplace and they start talking amongst themselves about who's the greatest. And so you can imagine how that conversation goes. Peter goes, you know what, dude? I'm the greatest. I'm Peter. He called me the rock. I'm a chip off the old rock. Jesus is the rock from out of the Old Testament. I'm the chip off the old rock. You think you're the greatest? You know, John, he just called you one of the sons of thunder. There's two of you. There's only one of me. You know, and so you could see how that conversation goes. And, and then John comes back with, Son, you know, sons of thunder is a good thing, Peter. Thunder, dude, falling from heaven, coming down, power of God. That kind of, you're just a stinking rock. And as a matter of fact, it's in the feminine, buddy. The words in the feminine, you're a girl rock. 
you know? And so, you know, and so you can see how, how that kind of conversation would go about who's best. And, and you got these other guys who are in the background. Well, you know, you guys think you're hot stuff, Peter, James, and John, and you're always around Jesus. Maybe the reason you're always around Jesus is because you're always in trouble. Maybe that's the, the reason you're around Jesus. He's got to watch out for you because you're always saying something stupid. Peter, every time you say something good, you say two things that are dumb almost immediately afterwards. What do you think? You know, what are you talking about? You're not the great, and so that's, that's how I think that conversation went, right? Because I, I've hung out with people like this. In any, in any case, <laughs> Jesus calls them on it. So they think they're back in the back having this conversation that Jesus doesn't know anything about, but Jesus knows everything. In fact, the conversations that you're having. And so he says, so what was it that you were fighting over as we were walking here? And they don't say anything because on the road they were talking about who's going to be the greatest. Well, Jesus, we were talking about who's the most awesome. That's what we were talking about. And so they're never going to say anything about that. And then he sat down, verse 35, called the twelve. Come here, come stand around. And then he says, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. And this is, this is where he brings in a little child and talks about receiving um, as a little child receives. And so obviously there needs to be humility. Luke 22, turn over to Luke 22. Another good passage. Verse 24 through 27. It says, now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And again, there's a number of places where this, ta you know, where this takes place. They, they, they were, you know, in, in this place right here, they're doing it at the Last Supper. Okay? So Jesus is about to die. He's told them he's going to die on the cross. And so they come in and they go to sit down. And there is apparently an argument about seating order around the table at the Last Supper. You guys, you guys have been around long enough to know that there was a seating order, right? And so you, you know, um, basically when you sat at the Last Supper, the guy in the second place was the host, that's Jesus. And there would be a guy, they, you know, they would lean on their left elbow, you know, on pillows or on couches. And so the table would be like right here and they would be leaning out with their feet out, right? That explains when Mary comes and washes Jesus' feet while he's sitting at the table. She's not crawling under the table. His feet are sticking out, which made me all kinds of blessed when I found that out because I thought the whole thing with crawling under the table was a little weird, you know? And, and so anyway, their feet are sticking out from the table. And so we know where John was sitting because John could put his, his uh, chest on Jesus or his head on Jesus' chest. So John's on the right hand. It was a place of honor. It was also the place for the youngest, okay? And then on his left hand, on his left side, would be Judas, because Jesus has to be able to reach Judas and give him the sop. Remember, he gives him the piece of bread. And so we know where Judas is, and that's the, that's the place for the guest of honor. And then it goes down in order from there, and we know where Peter is about, because Peter is across the table from John, and he's talking to John and saying, ask him who it is, because Jesus had said, one of you is going to betray me. Right? And so there's a seating order. And so when the seating order comes up, these, these guys go in and, and uh, Jesus probably gave the seating order to John and then he gave it to Judas. And that was an act of mercy on Jesus's part for Judas. And then probably the rest of the guys just picked their places. And Peter was probably pretty torqued about the fact that he was on the bottom end of that whole thing. And so there's a dispute about the, who's gonna be the, um, who would be considered the greatest. And so you can see how that dispute would go too. Well, you know, you know, it's like, well, I'm over here in this better spot, Peter, and you're down over there. You're down at the end of the table. And Peter goes, it doesn't matter where you sit at the table. You know, I'm Peter, I'm the rock. And you get back into that whole thing again. You know, chip off the old rock and that kind of stuff. And John's like, feminine, feminine, you know. <laughs> and doing those things. And what I'm talking about is in the Greek. In the Greek, the, the term is feminine. In any case, there's an argument about who's the greatest, and Jesus says to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, but not so among you. On the contrary, he who is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who, who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as the one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom 
just as my father bestowed one upon me. And, uh, you know, again, he goes on in that passage. And so um, you have Jesus telling us how this is supposed to go. And so there are places of authority in the church. I'm in one of the places of authority, but that doesn't mean that I'm excused from being a servant. And uh, again, you can tell when you're a servant, when you get power, what do you do with it? Do you start lording it over people? Do you just start trying to take control of people's lives? Do you, talk, do you try to micromanage everything, run everybody, and that kind of thing? When you get some power, is that what you do? That is not what Jesus does, and that's not what we're supposed to do. When God gives you something to do, you're supposed to be faithful to it. Um, you're not supposed to abdicate. You don't give it off to somebody else. You make sure that you're doing the things that Jesus wants you to do in this situation, but you don't make it your own little sub-kingdom. You don't make it your, you know, your, your little tyranny, your little, you know, your, your, your little power base. That's not what we're supposed to do. That's what people do in the world, and that's not what's supposed to be happening with us. Turn over to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. We were just in Colossians, and so it's right before that. In Philippians 2, 3, 3 through 5, it says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And then he gives an example of Jesus' humility and coming down to the earth and leaving everything in heaven behind. I want you to look at, uh, really closely at, uh, again, at verse three. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each, each esteem others better than himself. When you're in the Gospels, Jesus says you need to love other people like you love yourself. And then we come up with excuses. And my excuse is, I can't love other people until I love myself. And you see that in Christian circles all the time. If I'm really going to love people the way that Jesus wants me to love people, i got to love me. And so then the focus becomes on me. And so I start trying to love me. And I work at loving me. And there are some times when I don't love me so much, and so I gotta work a little harder on loving me. And I spend a lot of time on me because I gotta love me before I can ever get to you. And that will go on for the rest of your life. That's, uh, that's what I grew up with. That's, that's what happened in my, in my family. My parents always told me, I gotta be happy before I can make you happy. I gotta love myself before I can love you. Those are the exact words that came out of my parents' mouths my whole life, my mom's still working on it. And it's a miserable life, and what ends up happening is you end up um, all by yourself, basically. That is not the way to go. Jesus did not say, go and love yourself first, and then love people like you love you. What he said was, go and love people like you already love you. You already love yourself. You know, I love myself. I get up in the morning, I take care of me, man. First thing that, ha you know, I've, I've, got, I've got some things that have to happen in the morning. I don't feel really well in certain areas. And so I go take care of me. And then I walk by the mirror when that's happening. And I look in the mirror and I go, oh, that's not good. And, and so I come, I come back in. I look in the mirror. I, just, I do stuff with a, with a washcloth and with a razor. And used to, used to happen, I, I, I did stuff with a brush or with a comb. I don't have to do that anymore. Now I just shave it off, and, but I'm taking care of me. And when I, when I put my clothes on, uh, I make sure that my clothes look as decent as possible. Usually my wife's setting those things out for me. She dresses me. And so uh, even when she dresses me, I go and take a look in the mirror. And then I'm like, oh, no, that's not good. You know, she tried, but that failed. And so let's try something else. And I make sure before I walk out of that room and that I look halfway decent because you know what? I love me. That's what I do, right? And then when I walk out of the house, I'm called to love you just like I love me. And you know, people, they kick against that and they have fits about that and they say, well, you know, if people love themselves so much, then why, they, why do they destroy themselves and, and that kind of thing? And you know, in, in most of the counseling that I've ever done, in all the years that I've done counseling, I have never found somebody that just literally hated themselves. What they hate is what they look like because the person they love, them, love the most doesn't look the way that they want them to look. They look in the mirror and they go, I hate myself. 
And that can be because you're, be, because you're overweight or because you're losing your hair or because you have zits on your face or, or something like that. It can, be, it can be those things. But you don't hate yourself. You hate it that the person you love the most has a zit. You hate it that the person you love the most is you know, losing their hair. You hate it that the person you love the most isn't as skinny as they used to be. That's what you hate. If you, if you actually hated yourself, you looked in the mirror and you're fat, you go, oh, that's awesome. Look at you, fatty. You are so fat. Look at you, you, you fat, 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 fat. That's what you'd be doing. Or you'd be looking at yourself and you go, oh, look at that big zit on your forehead. You deserve that and you deserve, deserve every bit of that and more. I am so happy you have a big fat zit on your forehead. That's what you say to people you hate. And nobody ever says that to themselves. They're just, you know, they're mad because life isn't going the way that they want it to go. The person that they love most is having a problem, right? And so I already have this love for myself. I'm supposed to be giving it to others, right? And in this passage, it says, not only am I supposed to love other people like I love myself, I'm to esteem them better than myself. So that kind of takes out that whole thing anyway. And so I don't have to love myself, uh, love myself before I love other people. As a matter of fact, I need to love other people better than I love me. And so that kind of takes out, you know, figuring out if I love myself. Just love everybody better than you love yourself, and you'll be in good shape. And again, it's others-centered. It's others-centered, and that's what ministry is supposed to be. It's supposed to be about the people that you're ministering to. And it doesn't matter where you're at. It doesn't matter if you're in my position or you're in a position of a Sunday school teacher. What you're supposed to be doing as a Sunday school teacher is loving the kids, trying to bring them to Jesus, trying to tell them about the Lord, that kind of stuff. And there are people who are over you. And when there's people who are over you, you're supposed to love them. So the, the people who are over me, and I don't have anybody, you know, in this place that's over me in that kind of sense, but, you know, I've had jobs and all my bosses loved me. In fact, uh, Kyle uh, plays, plays basketball with one of my old bosses. And, and one of the things that Kyle said to me was, Steve, you know what your old boss thinks about you? And he told me all this stuff that he thinks about me. Well, that, that, that's like almost 30 years ago that I had a job with this guy. And he's still talking about the, the, the stuff that I did with him. And you know why he's talking about that? Because I treated him like he was Jesus. I worked for him as if he was Jesus. And so if he told me to do something, I'm like, all right, boss. You know? and, and I always watched his back. If he told me something to do that I thought was wrong or wasn't going to work, I'd go up to him and I'd say, hey, you know, um, it, you know, Bruce, it doesn't look like this is going to work. What do you think about this? And that kind of, you know, and I went through and did, and did that with him. First times that I did it with him, he kind of stepped back and he was like, what are you doing? And he didn't say that to me, but it was like he didn't know how to take me. And then he'd go, well, that's not how I want to do it. I want to do it this way. And I go, okay. And then we go off and do it. And I'd, I'd get it done. And there were times when there was mistakes. And, and you know, I'm, I might have been right in a situation. But you know what? He pays me to do it. He pays me to take it apart. And he pays me to do it again. And so that's okay with me. You know, <laughs> you know I'm getting paid. And that kind of stuff. And, and what it did with him was it made him uh, trust me. Made him trust me. And so, that, so people who are over you, you treat them like they're Jesus. And you, people who are under you, you treat them the way that Jesus would treat them. And that's the way that ministry is supposed to go. And when it doesn't go that way, when you start you know, etching out a little kingdom for yourself, and you, in fact, over in the Sunday school, Greg DeRoos is over the Sunday school, right? So he runs that place and that kind of thing. And some of you are doing Sunday school under him. Well, you know, you decide to take over the fourth grade class and make it the kingdom of, you know, whatever your name is. I'll just pick a name that I don't know that we have in our church, the kingdom of Phyllis. So Phyllis goes over there and she's running the fourth grade class and she starts making it her own little kingdom. And when Greg says, hey, you know, we've got some curriculum for you. You know, we're going we're gonna to do this because we're going to, you know, integrate it with all the kids and that kind of stuff. No, I don't want to do that. What I want to do is I want to do what Jesus tells me to do. And Jesus has told me not to do your curriculum. Do you think that Jesus told her not to do the curriculum? When she was praying, do you think that from heaven, God was saying, don't do that curriculum. In fact, give Greg DeRoos as much hassle as you can. Because Greg DeRoos, I don't know if he knows me. You know, <laughs> that is not happening. 
And so that's somebody who's trying to eke out a little kingdom for themselves and, and just be in a pain. And that is not what we're supposed to be. And so when my boss would tell me to do something, okay. You know, if I thought it was wrong, I'd let him know because I need to watch his back. And when he said, do it anyway, I'd go, okay. You're the one who's in, who, who's in authority. You're the one who's in responsibility. And that dude loves me, Kyle told me. 30 years later, that dude loves me. That's the kind of witness that we're supposed to have. That's the way that it's supposed to go when we're ministering to people. And so it's a, it's a cool thing when it works right. I'm not saying I'm perfect and all that because I've had my moments. I'm just like anybody else. And when I've had my moments, you know what I do? I go up to the boss and I apologize. And I say, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. I shouldn't have been like that. And I'm sorry. And um, if I did it in front of the crew, then I apologized in front of the crew so that everybody heard me. And, you know, you know Ken, that's the, that's the way you do those things. And so Diotrephes has a little sub-kingdom. And um, part of Diotrephes' uh, ministry is as slanderer. I wrote to the church, verse 9, back in 3 John, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious, malicious words. Um, that, that word for prating there is the idea of, of uh, a pot that's boiling and bubbling over. It's also used in terms of somebody who has gas. And so they, they, have, a, they have a belly that's full of gas and they have to belch. And so this guy's belching out these words against John. And again, it's against John, the apostle John. Again, Diotrephes, you moron. I don't know if this guy's in heaven or not. I don't know if he's a real believer or not. If he's in heaven, that's a little embarrassing, don't you think? He stands before Jesus, stands before the Father, and they, the Father goes, so, Diotrephes, guy who loves to have the preeminence. So who are you? You realize that every word that's in this passage is, is, is written down. It's something that's inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is saying, this is a guy who belches garbage. And, you know, again, an evidence of where his heart is at. He's a slanderer. People who are slanderers, you don't hang with. People who are slanderers, you don't listen to. People who are slanderers, you don't engage them, except to tell them to, to stop it and go talk to the person that they have the attitude with. There's way too much listening to slander in the Christian church. And it doesn't matter who it's about, you know? It's like, you know, one of the, one of the things that you, that you need to watch out for is even in the area of media, you know, we hear these things about church leaders and um, sometimes they're true and sometimes they're not true. Some, sometimes you're getting stuff on, on Facebook and on the internet that could be the truth, but you don't know if it's the truth or not. Let me tell you something about media. Every time that I've been interviewed, um, except for, by the Christian station in town, every single time that I've been interviewed by a news reporter, they have misrepresented what I've said. They've, they've, and it doesn't matter if it's on video or if it's an oral interview, they've misrepresented what I've said. And so when I'm talking to people that are interviewing me, I'm talking to them about the things that Jesus is doing. I'm talking to them about the things that God is doing. I'm talking to them about the, the cool things that um, are at work at here, here at Calvary Chapel. The last time I had an interview with somebody was when we built this building and we were over in the amphitheater a couple of years later and they came out to interview me because the amphitheater was cool. And so they wanted to talk about it. And so I made sure that I was speaking in short sentences, small clips, and I did my best to say nothing except for things about what Jesus was doing. I tried really hard because I knew how this was gonna go. You know what they did? They found, they, you know, it's like, it was like a 15 minute interview. And when it got onto the news, there was nothing about Jesus, nothing about what God was doing with Calvary, nothing about that stuff. And they took a couple of sentences that I spoke throughout that whole thing that had really nothing to do with anything that they were talking about. And that's the stuff that they put on air. And so I don't believe the things that people say specifically about Christians in the newspaper. I don't believe what they say in the news necessarily. And so whenever I hear something about somebody, I'm always like, okay, well, need to check that one out before I go for that. And I don't care where it comes from. 
And so we need to be people who don't, who don't get into that. Nowadays, when, when you look at, at news media, man, the stuff that they say about the president, the stuff that they say about his cabinet, the stuff that they say about you know, anybody in office that they don't agree with, all the stuff that they say, man, nothing but slander. It's like ridiculous. I have never seen this in my life on the news. That is not what the news used to be like when I was a kid in the 60s. It wasn't what the news was like in the 70s. It started becoming like that in the 80s. By the time we got to the 90s, it was a little bit more like that. And now we're at this point where it's nothing but a reality TV show, basically. Everybody's slapping each other across the face with their mouths. And, and it's nuts. I think it's, a, it's, it's part of what's going on with the internet and with Facebook and, and those kind of things. And you need to watch what you say on Facebook. You need to watch what, you, what, what you're saying when you're, when you're writing to people, when you, uh, when you are um, emailing people, that kind of thing. Um, there, there is, um, in Christian circles, actually it's just everywhere, there, there is, there's a situation where people feel free to say things about people that they would never say to their face. That's why John says in this passage, if I come, I'll call to mind his deeds, which he's done prating against us with malicious words. We're going to have a little face-to-face -face when I come. That's the sons of thunder coming out in John at that, at that point. It's a good thing. Face-to-face -face is always better than over the internet or hearing it secondhand. Um, he refused to recognize those who were sent by John. And, and so you have that in the passage. And they were for, he was forbidding hospitality on the part of others, putting these guys out of the church. And so I don't want to have anything to John. I don't think John's all that great. Anybody who comes from John, I don't want to have anything to do with them. Uh, and, uh, and as a matter of fact, John is a this and John is a that. And we don't know exactly what he said, but they were malicious words. And he, and he was trashing the guy um, when he should have been respecting him. And again, that's not something that a believer does. And so when I am around somebody who has a problem with slander, I um, have my, um, I have my antenna up. I'm around somebody who's got a problem with gossip. I am paying attention uh, when I'm talking to them and I'm trying to figure out whether they're a Christian or not, whether they just have a problem in this area and I don't have a problem in the area. I've never been a guy who went around and did this stuff, you know, as a, as a real issue in my life. And I'm not saying that I've never talked bad about people behind their back because I have, but it's not something that I do, that I ever did all the time. Even when I was an unbeliever, I didn't do that stuff. If I had a problem with somebody, I just went and it was me and them and we'd have a talk. I didn't spend a lot of time talking to other people about, about um, somebody behind their back. And so that's never been a real issue with me. I know that it's an issue with other people though. And so when I'm talking with somebody and they are trashing somebody in front of me, we have, some, we have some words. And the words are, you need to go and talk to them. Don't sit here and trash them to me. You need to go and talk to them. Talk to them, you and them alone. Have you done that? Well, no. Well, then what are you talking to me for? Well, you're the boss around here. What? Is that what Jesus said? You got a problem with somebody? Go talk to the pastor. Is that what Jesus said? No, did not say that. You go talk to them, you and them alone. And then go to two or three other people to go with you if it's not getting fixed. Is the pastor included in the two or three other people? There's no passage that says that. And so I don't even need to be included in the two or three other people that need to go and talk to the guy. And I don't mind. You know, if somebody comes and says, hey, will you come and, and check this out? I don't mind at all. I don't have a problem with that if I've got the time. But that's, it doesn't say that the pastor needs to be involved in every dispute that goes on um, in a church. That is not what's supposed to be happening. And when it's a, you know, and, and, and people try to make a distinction with, with employees. Well, I got a problem with one of your employees. Well, did you talk to them about it? Well, you're the boss. So did Jesus say that, in, you know, in the area of employee, if you've got a problem with one of the employees, you don't go talk to them. You go talk to the boss. Did he say that? No. He said, you got a problem with somebody, you go talk to them. And so the employees here are still brothers, they're still sisters. And so you go and talk to them first. If somebody comes in and talks to me about one of the guys in, uh, that, that's on staff and starts having an issue, you know, is having an issue with them, that's the, always the first thing that I ask them. Did you go and talk to them? And if they say no, then I go, that's what you need to do first. And I stop them, you know, I stop them real quick because I don't want to hear about it until they've gone and talked to them alone. Same thing with the school, have parents in the school. And the parents in, in the school will have a problem with one of the teachers and, 
and uh, you know they'll they'll uh, write to Bobby about the whole thing because Bobby's the principal. And the first thing that Bobby does is she she goes, uh, "Did you talk to the parent or did you talk to the teacher?" And you know what they always say? No, I'm telling on them. I'm three years old and I'm tattling is what I'm doing right now. No, I did not go talk to them. And so, you know, make them go talk to the teacher. After they talk to the teacher, if it doesn't get taken care of, then other things can happen at that point. But, you know, we need to be adults. And all this is evidence of a heart that does not know the Lord. Forbidding hospitality, hospitality on the part of others and so on. I just look at the clock. I'm sorry. Let's, let's wrap this up. Verse 12, Demetrius, he says, oh, actually, verse 11, beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil has not seen God. Talking about diatrophies from John the Apostle. And so you can learn from a good example, you can learn from a bad example, but we need to learn it. And then he goes on and says, Demetrius, on the other hand, has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness, and you know that our testimony is true. And so that's something that should be said of each one of us. I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write to you with pen and ink, but I hope to see you shortly and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet, uh, greet the friends by name. And so John, again, um, is talking about the fact that it's better to have conversations face to face than writing to one another. And I think that that's absolutely scriptural. You know, when, when you are talking to somebody over email, you are not able to, uh, unless you are a very good writer and you have a lot of time, you are not able to give tone. You're not able to um, uh, necessarily share your heart. And a lot of times the things that you get shared can be viewed in a negative fashion depending on the, on the mood of the person who's receiving it. And it may be something that, that, that you would never say to them in a, in a mean way. And so face-to-face is always better. If you can't get face-to-face, phone call. The same thing that you're texting people on, it's got this little button down in the lower left. It looks, it's usually red and it looks like a phone. Old, old, old style phone, you know? One of those phones that went on a, you know, clicked on a big thingy, you know, big, had big old knobs on either end. That's the phone button. And so instead of texting and, and doing LOL after you've said something that's so totally snotty they want to rip your head off, you know, instead of doing that, you could hit that little red button and talk to them on the phone. And they can hear your tone and all that kind of stuff, and it, and it helps with communication. And even better than that is face-to-face, right? Okay, and I'll let you out of here. Um, last guy, uh, obviously, John is an elder, and he's a man who prays, rejoices in the godly walks of others. He's a spiritual father. He's an observant shepherd. He's an encourager. And he's a mad man that's not afraid of confrontation. That's John. Now let's pray. God, thank you for John. Thank you for rowdy guys. Thank you for rowdy guys who grow and become loving men. And uh, Lord, we thank you for the growth that we've seen in ourselves. Thank you for, for the fact that you took a group of people who were rough around the edges when we first started out and you began chipping things away and began making us more like you. And that's really what we want, Lord, to be more like you. Um, God, help us to be servants and to serve the, the people that we're under, whether it's at work or whether it's in ministry or whether it's in family. Um, we have family that deserves our respect, even, even though they may not, not have lives that are specifically fulfilling everything that you've said. Lord, help us to, to be people who have a good testimony and uh, who uh, walk with you in such a way that people can see it. And bless these people as they go their way. And thank you for their patience in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.